Um, good afternoon, I'm very happy you came. Um, and um, I will present uh, as short as possible. Uh, I will just run through some slides uh, to uh, give the foundation of what, why, uh, what I want to say. And then uh, I suggest that the uh, discussion will be open. Um, so write yourself uh, questions or comments. Don't bother to put a question mark. I will relate to any comment as if it was a question anyway. Uh, so um, um, I will uh, <clears throat> just basic facts that are concerning our issue. Our issue is, is relations between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. In Israel, you know, history is being uh, looked upon from different angles. Uh, this is the angle I suggest to look um, um, uh, for this discussion. Um, and um, the bottom line is that today in Israel, there, are, there is a majority of Jews and a minority of Palestinians inside the state of Israel. You all can envision the, 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 um, uh, the map, right? Just... Okay. This is the map of Israel. Inside the state of Israel. Can you all see them the It's been years since I used the chalk. <laughs> I used to be a teacher in the in the 80s. This is the state of Israel. Except for the West Bank. Okay? Within the state of Israel, the citizenry of the state of Israel is consisted of 70 oh, of, of uh, um, 80, 20, uh, majority, minority. And this is the very basic fact for the talk, for the conversation, for the discourse that we're trying to build. The two tectonic plates under the state of Israel are Jewish and Palestinian. Israel, in the past 10 years, is going through rough time with regard to the uh, relations between Jews and Palestinians. Um, th within the Israeli citizenry, again, I'm saying it, um, we're suffering um, racism, open racism, derived from the Israeli government that reflects many in the Israeli public. The government, the Israeli government now, is not directing, is not showing the direction, but following the direction of open racism, the, um, the racist sentiment that is out in the public, in the Jewish public, uh, that was um, fostered fostered by the government, as well as uh, grew in, in the uh, past, say, 15 years, very much, not entirely, but very much as a response to the Second Intifada. The Second Intifada, year 2000 and up, has, um, was rough, vicious, Many died. The, um, the um, general feeling in Israel was unsafe. People were unsafe. In the beginning, Jews, and then the Palestinians, with the reaction of Israeli uh, government. Um, and uh, this great sentiment of resentment evolved to open racism. Um, but on the other side, there's a con counter stream that is working in the very same time in parallel, both in the Israeli government as well as in the public, 
uh, conflicting uh, two different streams that are um, uh, taking place both in the public as well as in the government. In the general public, Palestinian citizens are making them their way into the center of the Israeli life, either as medical staff, senior medical staff, or uh, 50% of the pharmacists in Israel are Palestinians, citizens. And whenever you go, you are getting a very good uh, service, professional service, not the, the, the guy in the garage. Professional, high professional service from Arab citizens. From the government side, something did happen in the past few years. Government has moved slowly into the uh, um, uh, recognition of the Palestinian citizens as a force that can be essential to the economic growth of the state of Israel. But this was not a governmental invention. You know those two people. They didn't wake up just one day and decided to do what they did. They were ready for this. They were prepared for this. They were, they were trained for this. And the foundation that prepared them and trained them for, the, for mobilizing the change was a foundation of civil society in the United States. Civil society uh, was uh, active, very active in the United States. Do you know of Rosenwald? You do? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, you are the first, this is the first talk that I'm giving here in the United States that people recognize Rosenwald. I will mark Austin. <laughs> yes. Probably it's one of the best kept secrets of the United States because people didn't know about it. And I learned it from the film, of course. Um, but these are two examples of civil society partnership between philanthropists and educational or social or political entrepreneurs who are preparing the next step of the society in a certain country. Do, and, and, and they do not, they did not, and usually appropriate civil society is not relying on the government to determine what's good for society, but determining it on its own. In Israel, the issue of relations between the Jews and the Palestinians, the Jewish and the Palestinian citizens, is totally emerging from the civil society. Governments, not all governments, not only Likud, uh, Avoda, uh, it doesn't matter which one, never took it as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as, as an agenda to promote relations between Jewish and Palestinian citizens. I remember invited to speak at the JCPA, the Jewish uh, Council for Public Affairs, years ago, ah, more than a decade ago. And the guy explained to me, what is the JCPA? He said, in every uh, Jewish community, there is a committee called the JCRC, the Jewish, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the Committee for um, Community Relations, uh, com uh, um, Committee for Community Relations of the Jewish uh, Community and the general community and other communities. And he told me that there are 124 committees like this in, in the United States, in each and every one of the Jewish communities, even in the Jewish community that there is no, uh, that there is no um, uh, allocation committee because they have no money, JCLC they have. Because this is the most important the existential issue for the Jewish people to live is by their relations with the non-Jews around them. 
He told me we are about five, six million Jews in the United States, amongst about 350 million Jews, uh, non-Jews in the United States. We have to get along with them. This is the reason. There is a committee in every community that is taking care of this. 85% of Jewish giving, Jewish philanthropy in the United States is going to non-Jewish causes. This is to state their awareness of how important it is to be in, in good terms with other communities around them. Can you imagine in Israel that there will be a JCRC or that? In each and every Jewish community in Israel, taking care of relations between this community and the non-Jewish community around it? Of course not. It's not it's because it's diaspora. They need it. We, Zionists in the state of Israel, walking barefoot as land, as, as, as lord of the land, we don't need JCRCs. We're determining our own rules here. And this is the spirit that drives the Israeli governments, all governments, until now. It is the civil society organizations who are bringing this notion onto the agenda. So civil society organizations can do two things. One, mainly, is to establish facts on the ground. That's Tzofen. Or to do advocacy. That's another uh, example I will, I will give you. Tzofen, if you are taking notes, write this name and Google it afterwards. Uh, I, I will bring four examples, so uh, you can just Google them later. Uh, Tzofen is establishing facts on ground. Integrating Palestinian academics in high-tech industry. That's it. Not more than that. Their goal is to reach, I think, uh, four times more than that. But it's a very good achievement up to now. Lately, the government started to cooperate with Tzofen also. Sikui, S-I-K-K-U-Y, is another organization in Israel, but is working on advocacy. Sikui is rarely establishing facts on the ground, but rather preparing um, uh, position papers and policy papers to the government, even though the government never invited papers. They push them. They prepare them, determining the agenda, what's needed, according to what they see from their own um, uh, angle. It's a joint organization, of course. Also, uh, Tzofen is a joint Palestinian uh, Jewish organization. They are determining what the agenda, what should be on the agenda of the government with regard to, to integration, and they are pushing it. Quite successful. Um, this one is not the government. This one is a, a project that they initiated a year ago, trying to push as much as possible Arab experts to the uh, studios of uh, TV, uh, TV uh, programs and uh, uh, years ago and always, Arabs were invited to speak at the studio or in the radio or were interviewed on the paper only about Arab issues. We need to, to oh, if you're talking about Arab issues, don't bring just Jewish experts to talk about the Arabs. This is patronizing. We will invite the Arabs to talk about the Arabs. This is a half step forward. That's fine. But Sikui is pushing the limits more asking to invite Arab experts on general issues, not on the Arabs. That's um, uh, creating a presence of Arab citizens in the discourse, in the general Israeli discourse. Uh, it was a great success, and, it, and, and this will grow even higher um, in this year, I, be, I believe. Um, this organization, Interagency Task Force on Israeli-Arab Issues, 
I truly suggest that you will get on their website. Lots and lots of information on the subject uh, you can find there. This is Facts on Ground, initiated by Sikui, but Sikui is not uh, uh, um, uh, doing things on the ground, so we left it. Uh, I, I used to be a director of Sikui. Uh, when I was already, we left it, uh, uh, but this is another cooperation between Jewish and Arab citizens. It's a joint organization of tourists, of uh, uh, tourism entrepreneurs. Wonderful. I would uh, suggest get on their website, Green Tapestry, it's called. Green Tapestry. Uh, before you go to Israel, if you go, um, they'll take you on a very interesting tour. The last cooperation that I want to uh, uh, present to you uh, is the one that I'm heading now, um, uh, hand in hand. Uh, it's a cooperation between Jewish and Palestinian citizens in Israel. It's partnership. It's not cooperation, it's a partnership. By definition, both own the partnership, the, the uh, venture. Um, uh, we invite the citizens to, be, uh, to send their kids to bilingual schools and to gather as citizens in, around the schools in joint communities of Palestinian and, citizen, uh, and Jewish citizens in Israel. It's in the main cities, it's in rural areas, um, and we have uh, now six locations, uh, and uh, the new one, I hope, that will be in Nazareth Elite uh, in September. This coming September, we are supposed to open a, um, a new kindergarten that will ultimately grow all, all the way to grade 12. Uh, you see the locations. The question marks is uh, places that we're not sure if we can open or not open there. But this is again a partnership between civil society activists and philanthropists with the consent of the government. But the government does not do this. They would pay to the schools whatever they pay to in any other school. But practically, in order to make a Bilingual school, you need as double as budget as you have for a regular school because simply because uh, we have two, um, two teachers in a classroom. One is speaking Arabic, one is speaking Hebrew. Now, I don't want to mislead you. The whole issue of bringing the children together is not to rely on them that they will do the job for us. It's to create a community around the school of adults who are practicing shared life, practicing partnership in a country that is doing everything to separate between them. This is completely counter to the general conduct of the state of Israel. In Israel, the, the order of, is order of separation. In the uh, living places, in main, and mainly in the education system. The school system is separated. I know it's hard to say it in the United States, but it, it is separated in Hebrew and in Arabic. The Hebrew one is divided to three uh, different three streams but the official israeli public system does not bring together jewish and arab students to, to, to school together it is civil society organization that is doing this with philanthropy and this is the whole notion <clears throat> of responsibility of citizens towards the future, their own future, not relying on the government for deciding for them. I'm happy to have with us here a parent in one of hand-in-hand uh, -hand, uh, schools in Haifa, Eldad Levy. He popped in from a, I, I, no, no, you're not, he's not missing a class. I, I, know, I, I don't know if there are professors here. Uh, um, but um, uh, he will complete his duties, I believe. Um, 
Uh, and uh, later, uh, I would like to, if, if, you, if you want, if you can, uh, to elaborate more. Uh, that's it. The responsibility of the, uh, of the people in the age of civic responsibility must be exercised, in Israel especially, because it is not the agenda of the government. Now, I would like to, it was short enough, I hope. Uh, we have 30 minutes, 35 minutes for discussion. So, um, and I would uh, suggest that I will take, I will not answer each. I will just take uh, three and will respond. I don't have even to respond. Uh, it's up to you. Okay? Uh, here, here we have first three. Uh, Go on. Go ahead. If you can just present yourself to, to the... Hi, I'm Michael Churgan. I'm on the law faculty. In terms of the university, when I was last at Hartford, they were very proud of the percent of um, non-Jewish citizens that they had at the university. Are, the un other uni are they and other universities doing things to increase enrollment of, uh, oh, all right. Yes, please. So the... Um, if you can just present yourself. I'm Davida Charney. I'm a professor here in rhetoric and writing. And I'm also um, on the board of the local chapter of J Street. So the question I have is that this, the... The civic organizations that you're talking about are doing work within Israeli borders with citizens of Israel, okay? Which I th I think is highly laudable and important. Uh, is it also preparing the way for a one-state solution rather than a two-state solution? Thank you. I am Tatiana Lichtenstein, History and Director of Jewish Studies. I didn't get you. Tatiana Lichtenstein. Tatiana. Um, I have one question of clarification and another question. Um, so when you say that uh, Palestinian students are not allowed in Jewish schools, that means it's just oh. that they are allowed, but just Hebrew language education, right? All right, I'll relate to it. Okay, yeah. good. Because that sounded very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this question was the Hand in Hand initiative what is your funding? What does your funding come from? Mm -hmm. All right. First and foremost, I have to make sure. Palestinian citizens are allowed in Jewish schools. They're not, not allowed. We're not talking, in this case, about apartheid. All right? They are allowed. And many Jewish um, um, high schools, mainly, mainly do have some 2 3% of Arab or Arabic speaking, mainly Druze, uh, students. And it's not something unheard of in Israel. There is, mainly in Haifa, in uh, Tel Aviv, and, and other places. But this is not the case, because it is Arabs in Jewish school now. School education in Israel, in general, is extremely political. And going to school in a Jewish school is, for some, would see this as a one track leading to one thing, serving in the army. You can take the Israeli uh, curriculum, and if you analyze it in this direction, it makes perfect sense. So in, in, in the case of Druze, maybe it makes sense to them. But in case of Palestinian citizens in general, Druze only make less than 10% of the uh, Palestinian citizens in Israel, then it does not make sense at all. And it's not only to the army. It's a general upbringing of Zionist approach, which is totally one-sided. It does not take in consideration the two tectonic plates. 
I have to get myself off this. It was just a joke. <laughs> so this is with regard to the school system in general. Um, it's, uh, I don't have to say that um, it, uh, there is no case of a Jew that is going to an Arab school. Okay? Um, funding for, um, for hand in hand goes, uh, in general, a hand in hand school is a public school. We are allowed to, 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 uh, um, to make it a bilingual school. Okay? 40% comes from the government, 20% come from the parents. This is shrinking because of government regulations that does not allow us to receive money from, from parents. And a growing uh, part of 40 plus from philanthropy. Okay, so this is again the philanthropic uh, civil society um, engagement that brings it uh, together. Um, Michael, then I will get you the name. Um, uh, the, all the universities are trying to increase enrollment in general, and of course, of Arabs, Arab students. Uh, the government in recent, um, uh, in recent uh, resolution 922, I think I mentioned it here, no, did I mention it? Yes, yes, I did. I did mention it here, right? Government resolution 22, 922, a part of it, large part of it, is going to increase enrollment of uh, Palestinian citizens in universities uh, as a gate for meaningful employment that would help uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the, well, the industry and the, the culmination of Israeli uh, economy. Okay, so um, it is a well uh, invested now nowadays um, uh, path. Um, it's a tough question. Uh, the question was whether a cooperation, a creating partnership, not cooperation, partnership between Jewish and Palestinian citizens inside Israel doesn't ultimately lead to a, a one-state solution. I put it this way, I, um, well, first of all, a waiver, okay? I'm Israeli, I'm a Zionist, I'm a, a member of a kibbutz, and I'm a male Ashkenazi guy, who, uh, everything, <laughs> everything. My Zionism is the belief, it's a belief that, um, the Jewish people has a right, a collective right, for collective Jewish life in the land of Israel. All the rest is how. And this is how. This is how I suggest to do it. In my opinion, the ultimate test of Zionism is its ability to create partnership on the collective level between the Jewish people and the Palestinian people. Now, the question, where exactly the, uh, the line will uh, go, this way or another, between the sea and the river, or with a line, uh, and what is the meaning of a line when you are partners? What is actually the meaning of, the, of this line between the states in the United States? Okay? when you are well federated and cooperating and have a sense of joint living, strong sense, and have a joint belief that the co is actually the living, then I will put, put it this way. A society that is equal, religiously equal, and open, inclusive, accepting 
both sides, and I'm not trying to pluralize the uh, dispute here. It's two tectonic plates. This kind of a society, I don't mind if it will be one, two, three, or four states. I really don't mind. It, is, it becomes not non-issue. Whether it will be one state, two states, whether it will be even an Islamic state, or even a halachic state, God forbid. <laughs> Basic equality between the citizens, I don't mind, you know, that the United Kingdom is a religious state. You know that. It's a religion. By, by definition, it's a religion. A kingdom. Actually, kingdom. Does any of the citizens there feel that? Really feel that? They feel it in the um, front page of the sun. I hope I at least addressed your question, if not answering it. OK, we'll take another round of questions. Yes. Uh, one, two, three, okay, good. My name is Megan Bennett. I'm a Megan. Um, I have a question about, you're talking about this grassroots movement for these partnerships. How widespread is this among Israeli citizens? Mm -hmm. And is there any push to advocate the representatives to actually change the government to uh, invest more in these kind of initiatives? And secondly, do you see any availability for this pattern to occur in the West Bank? And is there any citizen engagement on that side for the same kind of initiatives? Thanks, Megan. Thank yes. My name is uh, Peter Stone. I'm faculty in the computer science department. Um, I came to your talk not knowing what you'd be talking about, but it so happens I think I have a friend who sent one of his kids who so was a parent in one of your hand hand schools, I think. His name is Mitha Sagid, um, lives outside of Haifa. But um, if it's not this, it's something similar. He described to me, I recall, that there's, you know, in the school there's a culture of the students, but there's also a culture of the parents. And he described to me in a broad generalization that in his daughter's school, the Palestinian parents would tell the teachers, if my student misbehaves, hit them. And the Israeli parents would say, if you don't give my student an A, I'll sue you. <laughs> what kind of culture do you get between the, the parents in these schools? Either way is violent. <laughs> OK. Yes, please. Yeah, Both of us had our hands up. Uh, mine's a real quick question. My name is Steve Gerson. Uh, you, you kind of disparaged all of the Israeli governments for helping foster the situation, but do you see now any parties or particular politicians that are more in tune with, with your point of view and might push this uh, to a better degree? That's a very interesting it's question. Like yes. The fourth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charlotte McCann, Charlotte? I'm a member of the Austin Jewish Community and part of J Street. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the high school curriculum in terms of teaching uh, the establishment of the state and the Nakba? Okay. Um. Megan, this is the, um, how, how widespread is the phenomenon of partnerships between Jews, Jewish, and, Jewish and Palestinian citizens? Um, until year 2000, there was this notion of coexistence in Israel. Um, I'm saying only in general because it was the general notion that we should live together and we want to live together. We are all people. And we, by engaging with the other so sociologists here, Olpot, 1953, the contact theory, by engaging, uh, we would uh, settle we would be able to live together. If we have good social relations between us, 
we can, we can make it. In year 2000, this uh, bubble has burst. The um, violent, um, uh, the violent uh, demonstrations of Palestinian citizens have encountered deadly snipers killing from the police. 13 of them were shot to death. Until now, we do not know who did it. They, the uh, police covered it uh, until now. This, it was not an incident, it was an earthquake that shattered the vulnerable coexistence partnerships that uh, existed until then. Uh, we have really announced the death of coexistence. It was then when partnerships started to be built. Only then. Because partnership means co-owning the venture, the organization, the uh, initiative. Co-owning is practically means that the Jewish side will have to give in. And the Palestinian side has to take responsibility. Both moves creates much backache to both sides. It's very, very complicated, but unavoidable if you want to build partnership. Co-owning. This is that. Where is Davida? She left. <laughs> I went back. Tell her when I was talking about co-owning, I referred to her again. Because it doesn't mean how many states there will be between the sea and the river. The state of Israel has two tectonic plates under it. And it should be co-owned by both. Okay? I hope it at least addresses your question, Megan. Um, uh, it's still not many. Hand in Hand is the single largest organization. Uh, we count... In the bilingual education in general, there are six hand in hand and another two uh, who are, um, uh, which are um, uh, independent, not with hand in hand, but operating just the same. So we have eight bilingual schools in Israel. Around each of them, there is a community. Uh, we count uh, 1,800 students with hand in hand and another 600 with Neve Shalom and Hagar in the Negev. Um, where's the map? And, um, and um, each school, right, all together, it's uh, uh, 2,400 plus 600 faculty uh, and, and staff. All together, 3,000 people in Israel are experiencing this experience every day. You can add all the other programs that Eldad knows more than I am, right? On a daily basis, I'm not sure any, there's no any other program that is on a, on a daily basis, but usually on a weekly basis, monthly basis, or once in a year. Altogether, how many? In, with, hand, with a bilingual education, we double it by four because each student or faculty is in direct contact every day with at least three family members, okay? So that brings us to 12,000 people in Israel were experiencing this every day. Their calendar is different than the rest of the country because it's inclusive. Their Hanukkah is shorter. Easter is shorter. <laughs> the Muslims have little, very few holidays. So when, uh, when Eldad uh, took his uh, uh, kids home on, uh, on, um, in the middle of the year, and, and probably um, uh, family members or neighbors asked him, why do you take your kids home? He said, it's the day that uh, Prophet Muhammad went up to the sky. Who knows in Israel? Who of the Jews know? 
hand in hand, people know. And not only know because they are taking the kids home, because there is an activity in the school in the same day, okay, about this. And about everything, every holiday, not every saint, because we, we, we don't celebrate 30, 65, 365 days a year, but, you know, many of them. So, um, I believe that there are another few thousand people in this world, 10,000 at least, who are experiencing this, I would count 25, 30,000 people in Israel who really feel the, these things every day in all the programs together. Mind you, electing one member of Knesset, whoever asked about it, is 34,000 votes. We're getting close. It's not that we want to vote someone in. But it's the notion of bringing in a subject matter on the agenda in Israel. Okay? Um, with regard to the West Bank, uh, let's leave it for later because uh, I don't want to miss other things. And I'll get back to it. Okay? Um, yes, it is different, uh, uh, Peter. It is totally different. Uh, mo most of what the um, uh, teachers and educators are encountering is the, the cultural differences, more than the political differences in the schools. Yes, the, and also sociological. The Jewish parents want their kids to be inclusive and to, uh, to be artistic and open and so on and so forth. The Palestinian parents send their schools so they ki their kids will get a, a, a push for mobilization, for social mobilization, to get their Hebrew right and to, do, to have good marks. And in the high school mainly, in the first few years, the Palestinian parents demanded that the kids will do physics and mathematics and chemistry and, and, and uh, things that will push them into the market later, into the uh, employment market. And Jewish uh, parents want their kids to, to study the arts and uh, filming. Filming was the thing, I mean. <laughs> why filming? Storytelling. And in, within few years, very few years, Palestinian kids betray their parents and they want filming too. They want to open their minds to things that they were not geared towards as mobilization. Those who possess, in other words, those who possess the means and the power do not need it. They can have fun. Those who must have a good professional for good making a living, must be pushed up. Does this remind you something about minorities? Of course, everyone. Do the parents interact with each other outside of the Oh, community? certainly. In, in community activities. Eldad, why don't you, yeah. why are you shutting up all the time? <laughs> I came to Help me so here. I, I was incorporated into this talk somehow. Uh. <laughs> so, I had the, the pleasure to work with Julie in different capacities, as you probably know this from the several references. Um, so I, I want to say I want to say one very important thing in regards to Megan's question, actually, on the change that has occurred in the field of peace building in the past fifteen years. And so I grew up in I grew up in a different organization, in Seeds of Peace, and maybe you've heard of it. It's a very well known organization, and 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 these organizations were were. Under, under the Oslo Accord and under, under the era of Oslo, in which there was a feeling that only fine-tuning was needed, right? It was, we're on the verge of peace, and we only need this, you know, we only need to get to know each other, you know. Be friendly. Be friendly, make one friend, et cetera, et cetera. And so when, and when that bubble burst, and that diplomatic peace, if we can call it, or that track one, what we, could, what we call track one peace, right? went down because it was clearly not going to uh, come out of, a, of, a, of, a, of an official or, a, or a state-oriented peace process. 
is when there was a, the, the, the peace building community had to make a, an extreme change to survive and to, and, and to basically reconfigure its understanding of what peace means. And this is precisely where organizations like all the organizations that Shuli mentioned uh, come out from, out of the notion that this is not going to be a diplomatic peace. This is going to be a community-based peace. And, the, and that the peace is not going to come out or the, this, this new understanding or new configuration of citizenship is not going to come out from this track one handshaking and suits and, and balloons flying in the air, but it needs to come out from the neighborhood. It needs to come out from the community. It needs to come out from parents that are neighbors and they have a children and they need to entrust their children, which as you, you, I'm sure you know, like, and I'm sure you agree, it's our most precious thing to an education system that is both innovative and is challenging and it's scary. And it is scary because the, the, the Jewish majority in Israel is so used to be, I don't want to use the word lazy, but in the, it, you suddenly have to do your cultural and identity work yourself, that you were so used for the education system to do it for you. You have nothing to worry about in the, in the public education system because your kids will be taught on the holidays and on all the, ne on, on all the convention narratives that they need to know. But suddenly you're making a choice of sending your children to hand in hand, and you need to make that, you need to interpret that to your children. You need to tell them, yes, this is, this is not our holiday, it's their holiday, but we celebrate with them. Uh, we're happy for them. And yes, this is a sad day for them, but, and, and we are sad with them. So it, it's really like, like she was said, this is a pain in the back, right? <laughs> Because suddenly there's a cultural and, and, and a, a cultural work to be done with their children, and there's a civic, it's a really civic work to be done with your children because you choose to do something that is not the norm. So, we have established a team in Hand in Hand in past three years. Uh, it's the dialogue team, consisted of top dialogue facilitators in Israel who is going and having dialogue sessions with each and every circle of hand in hand. It's the faculty, the, the, the um, teachers, the um, parents, the school principals, and so on and so forth. And the dialogue sessions are designed to help the participants make this step forward. And to us, dialogue is not talking. It's a process of change via talking, okay? But they do allow not just to ventilate their feelings, but to create, they're creating a process that allows the participants change their own attitudes no matter what. Some of them are going this direction, some of them are going that direction. It's all respected, as long as it is in the very same arena, and it's shared, it's co-owned, okay? So the parents are exposed to this in so many ways. It's the basketball team in Jerusalem that is playing in the municipal league. It's the um, texts reading um, uh, group called Madrasa Bet Midrash, in, uh, in uh, Wadi Ara, it's the, um, the um, trips that the parents from Haifa are taking together to Jordan last, last weekend in the Carmel. You weren't there. Um, and you name it. Dozens of activities all the time are going on. Not all of them. I, some of them I know only retrospectively from the Facebook. Local initiatives that are, people are getting together. Because they want it, because it's theirs. They own it, okay? Um, Steve and Charlotte. Um, racism among politicians is all over. I found uh, in my years with Sikui, I, I worked for 10 years as the CEO of Sikui, the advocacy group. Uh, 
I found allies in the Likud and opponents in Meretz. Yeah. And I have examples. I will not say it here. But um, um, the, the attitude towards inclusive society that includes also the Palestinian citizens, not only the Israeli different groups, the, I'm sorry, the Jewish different groups. The attitude towards this, which is a test case in politics, is uh, mainly on the left side, but not only. And the left side is not entirely clean. Internal, very basic racism exists everywhere. Therefore, when it comes to, to a test, when a member of Knesset who is uh, left of center has to uh, raise hand for uh, allowing Palestinian uh, farmers to receive more quota to produce eggs, the state is determining this. He doesn't raise his hand, although he's left of center. Uh, because he, he, it's interesting. He represents the uh, Jewish farmers. And they keep all the quota of, uh, to themselves. Is that racism? Is this inclusion? And he would go up in the, on the podium in a demonstration and say, we want peace. So what? OK? So it's very tricky. You have to check them one by one and suspect them all the time. <laughs> Nothing new. Charlotte, I have only three minutes for this. It's a very important issue. Basic rules in hand-in-hand -hand, uh, bilingual education. We include everything in. We do not exclude anything except for violence and intended ob um, offense. Offense, not offense, intended offense is excluded. All the rest is included. Because we, we know that everything is, because we are bringing two populations of that are, their narrative is excluding each other. The narrative excludes each other. Apparently, we know that in 1948, one thing happened in every single place. Historians here? Ah, right, Tatiana. One thing happened. So many stories. So many narratives. We include the narratives in our own. We're not, we're not historians, OK? So we're not going with science here. We're going for building society. We include the narratives in our own arena that brings together the Jews and the Palestinians. We have to do this. So Yom Atzmaut, by law, is celebrated in the school in a ceremony. Actually, it's not Yom Atzmaut. It's the Memorial Day prior to Yom Atzmaut, OK? A day before. So the ceremony is taking place in the school by law. Yom HaZikaron, uh, the Memorial Day of the fallen uh, Israeli soldiers. So this is how it looks in Jerusalem, where, where we have, you asked about the high school. It, it goes everywhere, no, but, but also <laughs> mainly in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is very dramatic because it's big. Half of our students, almost, almost half of our students are in Jerusalem. Um, uh, there's this ceremony at 11 o'clock. And there is this gathering of the Palestinian students <coughs> telling the story from parents and grandparents and the story of families of the Nakba. After 20 minutes, there is a recess of five minutes, while they are gathering in the gym for a shared ceremony. I'm shivering as I'm, I'm uh, remembering this every, every year, a shared uh, ceremony 
uh, that is called From Pain to Hope. And the children experience both. One, they experience, the Jews experience their ceremony of, uh, in memory of the fallen uh, soldiers. The Palestinians experience the stories in their own setting. We call it uninational setting, provided that there's a binational setting together that is summing up everything. And they are bringing both, representing words and um, poems and whatever was written, was uh, said then, bringing it to the shared uh, ceremony. Um, this is the art of inclusion. Uh, and this, the parents, the, the, the teachers and the uh, uh, educators are doing this every day. It's every day in the classroom. It's not only on Yomat's mouth. It's every day. It's all the time. Okay? The question was about in other high schools, uh, not the hand-in-hand -hand high schools. Well, just in general. Sort of in general? That was the question? I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking about, uh, so you see how self-centered I am? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, of course, Nakba is not mentioned at all. It looks even as if it's, in, it's forbidden to mention the Nakba. It's not true. The law in Israel is not, does not forbid mentioning the Nakba, does not forbid uh, learning about the Nakba as Nakba. Did I say the word Nakba? It's recorded Nakba. <laughs> it's not forbidden. It is a bylaw, an addition to a very small part of the bylaw of the Israeli budget, the Israeli finance. Um, it says that the Israeli finance minister is allowed, doesn't have to, allowed to reduce from the budget of an Israeli budgeted institute that, uh, that conducted a ceremony that expresses mourning of the, following the creation of the State of Israel. Mourning the creation of the State of Israel. Then, if they had a ceremony, then, Minister of Finance is allowed to reduce from their funding up to three times of the budget that was used to conduct this ceremony. Two, three hundred shekels. If they, hire, if they rented chairs or used the uh, electricity for the, not even once, this has happened, not even once since then, 2012, I think. No, 12 or 15, I think. Yeah. Pardon? It was in the last few years, I know there was some change. Yeah. Okay, now, yet, the discourse around this is being used to finger shake, and people think that it is not allowed to say the word Nakba or to learn about the Nakba, or to mention the Nakba, or to um, um, discuss the Nakba with others. It is deliberate, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, there is a term for this in English, I'm sure, pardon? Intimidation. 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 But there is uh, this uh, um, uh, intimidation suits uh, the intentional suits that are int uh, intended to shut up. What do you call this? Well, I'm sure you have a term for this. Lawsuits? Lawsuits. If there are lawsuits to men uh, designed only to shut someone up. Afkhada, um, uh, intimate. Anyway, you know what I mean. To intimidate the public at large from discussing this. And this is not the only law that is being passed. Only, this is not the only minor law that is being passed in the Knesset or even suggested to the Knesset just to create an atmosphere, 
to create a discourse, not to pass a law. In the past few years, we are exposed to this. And a civil society that determines its own agenda apart from the government, we have to know how to encounter it. I think your time is up. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I, I'm okay with staying, but okay? Thank you.